Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder, Bacon some sh Bits. Okay, so I just want to start off by saying happy springtime. Don't know if you can see this because we're watching the video version, but I've got on this really cute green dress. It looks like a nightgown, but it's a dress, I assure you. I'm ready for summer, and we're making a somewhat summer recipe, but before we get started, I have a phone call coming. My stomach is calling me. Hello? Yes? You're going to be hungry in 30 minutes? You want a delicious, wholesome, home-cooked meal in 30 minutes? You want me to go look online for a recipe, print the recipe out, get the ingredient list, go to the grocery store, which on average takes about 41 minutes, and then drive all the way back home, portion out the ingredients, make the meal, which takes about 30 minutes? No, yeah, there's no way. You're just gonna have to be hangry. Nope, I can't do it. I can't do it. Unless I can. I've been talking about this for so long. I am obsessed with HelloFresh. And I feel like especially the past year and a half-ish, we've just been getting into this routine. I wake up at the same time. I do the same things every single day. And at one point, I was eating the same thing every single day. And then I was like, you know what? Let me check out America's number one meal kit. They must be number one for a reason. And then I found out that life can be revolutionary. And listen, I don't care what's happening out in the world right now. You still got to eat. No more grocery stores, no more stressful recipe planning. All you have to do is wait for your delivery and everything you need to make a wholesome, delicious meal is delivered straight to your door. They offer so many different recipes to choose from every single week so you never fall into the routine of like, oh, the same thing for lunch every day. They also are really accommodating. So if you guys want to eat low calorie, pescatarian, carb smart, vegetarian, they have so many options for you. But the cool thing about the produce is that it's sourced directly from the farmers and it actually arrives to your door faster than it would arrive to a grocery store which means it's at peak freshness peak taste peak nutrition you can actually get dinner from start to finish on the table in 30 minutes and if you use their quick and easy options that's 20 minutes to get a wholesome home cooked warm meal on the dinner table amazing now you're probably thinking this sounds luxurious this sounds mad luxurious stephanie sue well did you know according to a study done you can actually save up to 28 percent by buying HelloFresh versus fresh groceries. And there's also way less food wastage because imagine you only need like a piece of a carrot, but suddenly you got a whole bag of carrots. What are you gonna do with the rest? You're gonna go to HelloFresh.com and use code 12BAM, that's 12BAM, to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. Hey, thank you HelloFresh for partnering with us on today's video, and let's get into the BAM. Okay, so here's the deal. We're making two ingredient chocolate truffles. You got friends coming over, this is a way to impress them. They're homemade, but you only need two things. This is probably more affordable than regular truffles. So you need a can of condensed milk and then you need a pack of hot cocoa. You can get Starbucks, you can get the Hershey's, whatever you choose. So we're gonna do 100 grams of this and 50 grams of this and then you guys can literally see what I'm about to do next. I got this recipe from Cooking Day, Cooking Tree. Delicious Day is one of my other faves, <laughs> but I got this from Cooking Tree. <laughs> Moments later. Oh no. <sighs> Why is the label coming? Okay. That's 120. Hold on, it's kind of already crazy. It's crazy! Okay, so we're gonna slowly scoop some out while I tell you guys about a movie that I watched. And I didn't think that I was gonna like this movie because it had pretty horrible ratings. <laughs> But I ended up, I ended up thoroughly enjoying it. So it's a movie called Elizabeth Harvest. And I went into it without really even, without really even reading these reviews. Without, without doing some extensive background research. I just read the plot and I was like, that sounds interesting. And I started watching it because I think it was like on Netflix for free or something like that. And so I'm like, okay, let's do this. I sit down and the entire movie, I was like, you know what? kind of like it it's like one of those trashy plot twist movies where like if you really sit there and you think about every single plot twist doesn't make sense you're like that realistically how is that gonna happen but in the moment you're like oh my god and you're just freaking out so i want you guys to freak out with me so uh you gotta have an open mind with this one you really do it called? it's called elizabeth harvest <laughs> okay. okay so it all starts with a young bride in the car it's a whole 50 shades of gray moment they're driving in this old school convertible down the mountains into this isolated mansion an estate a manor and um she's talking to herself so it's like a voiceover and she's in this wedding gown and her husband's driving and she's saying you know i always had a dream that I would, you know, meet a brilliant man and he would steal me away from everything that's ugly in this world and then we would just live in a world 
that's just our own, in a world of our own. And they are driving to his isolated mansion where I imagine they're gonna have a world of their own. They're gonna be completely isolated. They're not gonna have no friends. So and they're wealthy. Oh, he's a billionaire. Oh, he's a billionaire. How long do I mock with this? 30 seconds. They're in the car driving up to this manor, this estate. Once they get there, he carries her into the house because he says it's a tradition. Um, he mentions- Carry like what? The wife into the like house. This? Yeah, yeah, it's, it is a tradition. I don't know. It's like you cross the... Wait, they're getting married or something? They already got married. So why is he carrying her? Because it's a tradition. But like if it's not a mansion, then you guys just walk. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know these rules, all right? So he starts carrying her into the house, which I think is very fascinating because you immediately get the impression that she's never seen this house. I mean, she married this man without even knowing where he lives, without ever once going to his place of residence. This sounds gnarly. And so she's carried into the house. She's looking all over the place and she seems very quiet. She's introduced to two servants, that's what he calls them, two servants by the name of Claire and Oliver and they've got a weird vibe about them and she's just like hello and the rest of the night is just incredibly odd you see it through this time lapse of her sitting there they're eating dessert together and the whole time she's like aggressively shoving dessert into her mouth while staring at her new groom who happens to be much older than her so he's like in his 60s she looks 19 she looks fresh out of fresh out of high school okay so it's just a lot then he carries her into their bedroom and they have you know their um, their wedding night stuff. Why am I suddenly not 25? They do it! <laughs> wow, that's a lot of dust. I'm sorry, Mango, why did you just run over here? <laughs> but it's not really like one of those regular movie scenes where they're doing it where you like hear the noises and then you get glimpses of their bods and stuff. It's very quick, like he just rips off her dress like with scissors and then she's just like pushed onto the bed and you just see her flop there and it's just it's got a weird vibe to it you're like what's this vibe i don't understand do they love each other do they not love each other is she like on drugs or something i don't know and so the next morning they wake up and he gives her a tour of this massive mansion he, every single door is like locked with um like i would call it like one of those are what are those called some sort of bracelet but you can have a chip inserted into your skin and all of them need your hand to have the chip inserted and then also you can do a code to get out of the house so to get out out of the house you need to input a code so it's kind of very odd so every room has like a like a sensor yeah even her closet i mean i guess that's just like a rich people thing so her closet is just filled with the best clothes the best jewelry everything and he gives her a tour of the massive place they've got this beautiful living room they've got a swimming pool they've got an indoor swimming pool might i add they've got a movie theater and they're in the basement exploring all these amenities and she comes across this one door and he stops her from opening it and he just tells her this is the one room that you're not allowed to go into you can go anywhere else this is just the one room that I like to have to myself like can I trust you and she straight up is like yeah that's fine and then he starts aggressively making out with her in the basement hallway and you just see Claire this very suspicious looking woman just kind of peering at them and you get the feeling that something is going on but she's you don't know the, what she's the, the quote-unquote servant yeah so I microwaved it for 30 seconds now we're gonna add in the cocoa powder or the hot chocolate powder in thirds we're gonna sift it in so she has this whole fun day planned you know she's just got going around using these amenities, going for a swim, and then he tells her that he has a business trip. And she seems really disappointed. She's like, on our honeymoon? And just the whole vibes are off. So he leaves the whole next day. She's just alone in this empty house with the two quote unquote servants. I'm just gonna call them employees. I don't like that word. And so she's just hanging out. She gets dressed, she puts on makeup, she goes for a swim. And then she becomes incredibly bored in the house and she keeps thinking about wanting to go into that forbidden room. Listen, if I get married to a billionaire, which I won't because, you know, I'm engaged. Him. <laughs> but like let's say that I got married to like a billionaire right and they're like hey you can have all these things just don't go in that room me I'm not going to that room okay like I'm already you will go into that room okay <laughs> your freaking curiosity will you think so? Yes. You don't think I would just have fun like You're being be a like, true crime moment? Like, crazy <laughs> you don't think I would just enjoy myself with all the amenities? You know, you don't think I would just like hang out at the pool? No. You think I'd go into that room and ruin everything? Yeah, I would, for sure. I'd be like, oh yeah, that's where all the unsolved mysteries are in that room.
all those sketchy disappearances. I'm gonna go find them right now. Until finally she's sitting in the living room. She's literally rolling around on the floor reading books and Claire asks her if she wants something for lunch and she's like, well, maybe a salad and a water. And she's like, on second thought, can I get a chocolate milkshake? And Claire is just kind of like laughing to herself and she's like, I don't understand what's so funny. Maybe it has to do with the fact that um, this is a 60 year old man who just married like an 18 year old girl who wants to drink chocolate milkshakes. I don't know, I'm not judging. And she asks Claire, how long have you been working for Henry? That's the guy's name. And she's like, a very long time. Can I ask you something? I mean, he's really smart, right? Like, he's got this high IQ. Why would he want to marry someone like me? <laughs> and Claire, Claire being the bad bitch that she is, she doesn't even try to sugarcoat it. She doesn't even try to be like, well, because you're so small and eloquent and, you know, you've got your own thing about you. She just goes, I don't know, and walks away. <laughs> 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 so the rest of the night she just does goofing around they've got this art room she goes and looks at all these fancy art pieces she takes a bath and that's when she sees oliver and claire going in the middle of the night into the grounds and this is when she realizes that oliver is blind so in the house it seems like he has really good um sense of i don't know how to explain it like he's really good inside the house he doesn't need a walking stick or a walking cane but outside you know claire is assisting him so that he can take a walk in some fresh air so she notices this and it's kind of peculiar to her because she didn't realize that and then she goes on about the rest of the night and tries to get into bed and around 4 21 she keeps waking up in the middle of the night and she decides you know what i'm gonna freaking ruin it i'm gonna go into that forbidden room so she starts just going room by room into the house exploring once she gets to the forbidden room the peculiar thing is that it's not locked every single room she needs to scan her like arm into right and you would think that this one would be locked or maybe it would only work for henry's arm but it's just it works for her so she scans her arm the door opens and she walks inside now we do know that henry well we don't know at this point but I'll give you a spoiler. Henry was this really brilliant doctor. Like he was incredibly smart at what he does. And he retired a billionaire because he pioneered this crazy new technique that just revolutionized medicine as we know it today. Blah, blah, blah. So inside you see a bunch of like lab equipment, which doesn't sound too strange. Billionaire doctor, why don't they have an at-home laboratory? And she walks inside and you see there's this entire wall of what looks like, um, like cells. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like the ones where you always see those in the movies they're like drawers like where you put dead bodies like in a morgue and she's like oh what's this and she presses a button and one of them shoots open and she sees a naked woman inside of that drawer with a tube in her mouth in like a little bit of water it's probably not water i'm no doctor and the crazy thing is it looks just like her what? So this is a sci-fi. Yeah, and so she freaks out. She closes the drawer and manages to knock over this like giant little stand, cuts herself, freaks out, runs back into her room and tries to go to sleep. And so Henry comes back the next day and she's trying to play it chill, but she's terrified of this man that she just married. So she tries to call her sister and the phone line is dead. There is no working phone inside of this house and she doesn't understand. So Henry comes home, he starts playing the piano for her and she's just staring at him like, is this guy gonna kill me? Why does he have multiple of me in the basement? I don't understand what's going on and why doesn't the phone work? And so she sits next to him and she asks, hey, is there any reason that the line is dead? And he's like, wait, who did you try to call? Well, I tried to call my sister now everything about this conversation is just strange like there's just something that you can't really pinpoint it's just an odd conversation so he tells her that happens sometimes you know like we're up in the mountains signals not the best over here why don't we do this though because i've missed you i went on my business trip why don't i have the servants take the day off the employees take the day off and we just spend the rest of the day in bed and she doesn't want to do this because she's like um excuse me i just saw you doing some crazy sh in the basement so she's like wait why don't we go for a walk at the pond i want to go see the pond and he's like no no and he drags her to bed and they do it like the whole day and he tells her right after all of this imagine you just get married and this is your new loving husband and he straight up tells her you have a very corruptible quality about you elizabeth what does that mean i don't know like he wants to corrupt her so that night they're laying in bed and they both pretend to fall asleep, but they're all, they're awake. Henry wakes up first and he looks over at Elizabeth and is like, oh, she's sleeping. So he gets up out of bed and goes towards the elevator in the house. Now the elevator in the house is like one of those bougie elevators that tells you which floor that it's traveling to. So Elizabeth, she sneaks out of bed, goes to the elevator, sees that it's headed to the basement floor and decides she's going to take the stairs to go see what he's going to do. Like, what is he doing in that basement room? Now, as she's going down the steps, 
and she hears this voice, and it's a man, it's Henry, and he says, Elizabeth, you don't deserve this, but you did disobey me, and he's got this giant knife in his hand. And so she starts running. She's like, oh, hell no. Starts running down the stairs, running to the basement, running to all the doors are locked. She can't get into the office. She can't get into the movie room. She can't get into the pool. She can't even leave on any of the doors. She tries breaking Wait, a so window. Henry saw her? Yeah. Henry knows that she went into the basement. I don't know how. Maybe it's the fact that her chip probably has a record. Girl, this dumb. <laughs> and so he starts freaking out. He's chasing after her. She's, you know, running for her life. And then eventually, he just calmly sits down on the living room sofa. And then he just vanishes. So by the time that she gets to the living room, she goes for the blow poke. Oh God, this is like reminding me of the Michael Peterson case that we covered on the podcast. But she goes for the fireplace blow poke and she's holding it and she's like, I'm, I'm about to kill this dude, you know? And she's running around and she decides to go up the stairs and that's when he grabs her leg, drags her down. And you just see that he just continually, brutally murders her. I mean, blood splatters everywhere. And you cut to the next morning where Oliver and Claire, his two employees, are helping dig a grave. And it's like the most perfectly dug grave. It's not like a, oh my God, this happened out of nowhere. Like, no, our boss just randomly killed someone. It seems like he does this a lot. So they dig this perfectly rectangular grave and they drop her body in that is completely nude, covered in blood inside of this plastic bag and they cover back up the grave. So they go in to eat breakfast as normal and Oliver is saying things about how um, a soul is like an egg. You can, he's like very philosophical. He's just talking his nonsense. Meanwhile, Claire, she gets so pissed off that she actually runs away from the breakfast table in a, like a, in a cloud of anger. So Oliver decides, you know what, Claire, I don't know what their relationship is, but I'm going to make her, that was dumb, <laughs> but I'm going to make her, I'm going to make her a thing of flowers. That's his favorite thing to do, is to a make bouquets. Yeah. So he makes her a bouquet, brings it to her room, and she's just not having well, it. Why is she upset? Because they just buried someone, I'm sure. Like, okay. it seems like that's the vibe, you know? Okay. Would you be chilling? <laughs> He's like, I don't see what was wrong with that one. That seems like a nice, pleasant morning to me. <laughs> So she's like, listen, I don't want you to make me flowers. I don't want you to do anything for me. I'm actually over it. Like, get out of here. And he just straight up tells her, I just don't understand why you don't leave if you have the choice. It doesn't make sense. If you hate it here, then why don't you just leave? And she's like, you don't understand, Oliver. You're just a child. It seems like he's probably in his like 20s. And she's like, you're just a child. You don't understand. And he straight up tells her, we're not the prize. We're the bait. You know that, right? And then you have no idea what that means because he just walks away and they don't have another conversation. And then six weeks pass and we get a very eerie scene of Elizabeth in the car giving a speech in her head about how she always dreamt of meeting a brilliant man who would steal her away from all the ugly things in the world and they would escape to a world of their own. And they drive up the hilly mountains into his estate, his mansion. He carries her through the threshold and he, she is introduced to Oliver and Claire. So you're like, oh my God, how many times am I gonna see this? Uh, I was worried that I was gonna see this scene like 25 times, but I didn't. So we see what we assume is the second Elizabeth, at least according to the film, because, I mean, there's no way that this is the first Elizabeth who has made it. There's no way that this doctor could have saved her from her injuries because, you know, he buried her and she was really brutally murdered. Like, I'm talking Ted Bundy style. So she goes through the same process as the first Elizabeth. We're going to call her Elizabeth number two. And she sees the entire house, gets the tour, goes to her closets, realizes how the doors work. And then again, we get to the forbidden room. He says, this is the one room that you are not allowed in. This time he gives a little bit more context. He says, you know, I don't think that there's any secrets between a husband and a wife and I'm just letting you know this is the one place in the house that is like my office and you know a lot of a lot of business people have high standards for their office they want a lot of privacy in their office right so this makes sense just don't go into this office this is my space and she seems totally chill with it Elizabeth number two seems more of like a relaxed persona so she's like yeah I don't give a let me go swimming. So she spends the rest of the day just like hanging out by the pool, going to the movie theater, like doing all these little things. And she realizes one day that Oliver and Claire are kind of nowhere to be found. 
and he has gone away on a business trip just like the last time. So she starts traveling around the art room. She sees this picture of a woman kissing herself in the mirror. And for whatever reason, Elizabeth goes straight in front of the mirror and starts making out with herself. Like I'm talking full on tongue and everything. And it's just like this really eerie vibe because I didn't even do that when I was 12, you know? Like when you're like, ooh, let me figure out how to like kiss someone. But she was like full on, what? like just, you never like practice making out, really? <laughs> <laughs> to a mirror? Not a mirror, but just like thinking about it. You're like, how am I gonna, how do you make out? Come on, these are thoughts everyone has repressed. It's in your memory, I know. I know it for a fact. You don't just wake up born to make out. No, 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 it's, it's a taught gift. <laughs> so she starts making out with herself in the mirror and you're like okay this elizabeth is weird and then eventually she goes into the forbidden room but this time it's a little bit different she pops open one of the doors and it seems like she has no recollection of any of this i mean we're assuming it's a completely new person so she opens one of the doors yet again another looking elizabeth comes out with a tube in her mouth she's completely unconscious and she screams but this time she doesn't close the drawer back up she just runs out of the room in horror in fear and I'm sure you can relate, like I would be screaming. And so we see that this, this next Elizabeth, Elizabeth number three, slowly wakes up from her slumber and takes off the tube and starts looking around. And now Elizabeth number two, she goes back into the bedroom and she falls asleep. I don't know how you could sleep after that, but she's like knocked out. She's really tired. And Elizabeth number three, who just walked out of that little room completely butt naked, walks up to her and starts touching her face. Like she's kind of amazed at this. And I, I would assume, like, can you blame her? Like if you saw someone that looked exactly like you, you just woke up in this random house i'd be like who are you what's happening i don't understand then she goes into the closet and i guess puts on clothes and then she disappears for like most of the film we'll meet her again at the end of this right but she just like vanishes so henry comes home and he's like oh wow are you having nightmares you were like screaming in your sleep and she's like no no i'm fine and she goes through the same process of feeling very very scared of her own husband and she says let me let me just go wash up so she rushes into the bathroom and she puts on the water and she's like panicking and he's he's talking to her through through the door and he's like what are you thinking about elizabeth and she's like nothing nothing i'm not thinking about anything and he's like you're lying to me and he manages to get the bathroom door open and she's just like no no, no i'm not thinking about anything and he tells her that when you know someone long enough you can predict their actions and if you can predict their actions, you can control them. Did you know that, Elizabeth? And she's like, all right, you creepo. No, I didn't know that. And as he's telling her all these creepy things, he starts wetting a towel, like a face towel. He's wetting it. And uh, he lunges at her and starts strangling her with this wet towel. So she's panicking. She's trying to kick him. I mean, her advantage is that like she's 20 and he's... He's kicking the bucket soon. He's like 70s, right? And so she manages to get up on top of him and she starts running. He grabs her by the leg, pulls her down again, and then tries to strangle her with this towel yet again. And somehow she manages to run away from him yet again. So she starts running through the house and we have the same old process, but this time it's in broad daylight where she can't get any of these doors open. She's freaking out. None of these, the front door, what is the code? What is the code? She's freaking the fork out. She runs to the kitchen. She grabs two kitchen knives and she starts sitting there and she's like, okay what do I do what do I do now this kitchen has a view into the piano room right and she hears the piano start playing so now we're assuming that straight up is he like just playing the piano right now waiting for her to come to die like he seems like an overly confident dude so she gets up from her crouching position behind the kitchen counters and stares into the piano room and the piano is automatically playing and he's not there and he comes up behind her and he starts strangling her. She drops one of the knives and towards the end, right as she's about to pass out, she stabs him in the back and they both drop to the ground and he seems dead and she does not. So now she's laying next to this dead man. I have so many questions. Me too. Like, is he dumb? Right. There's gotta be something bigger. Oh yeah. I mean, either the movie is really poorly filmed or uh -huh. everything happened for a reason, right? My measurements were wrong. <laughs> Supposed to be a thick dough.
this is the very strange part for me. You would think that she would kind of freak out, trying to look for Claire, trying to look for Oliver. I mean, I guess maybe you wouldn't trust them at all. I probably wouldn't. But she, the next couple of actions she takes are very, very ruthless. She just drags his body into the elevator, takes all of the bloody clothes, burns them in the fireplace, and starts cleaning up all the blood from the floors, cleans up the blood from the kitchen knife, puts it back in the kitchen knife set, and just takes a nap on the couch because she can't escape. Like, there's no way for her to get out. I guess maybe she's waiting for them to come home so that she can bolt it for the door. And that's where she hears a phone ringing. So she's like, oh my god, this is my chance. There's a phone that's actually working. She goes towards the ringing sound, finds a cell phone, and she immediately dials emergency services and asks them to come pick her up because, um, holy cow, she's locked in this house. She has no way to get out. This is crazy. I don't know what's going on. And they're like, well, what's your name? And she's like, Elizabeth. And then she gives the last name of her newly husband. It was like Calligan or something. And they kept asking for the address. Like, what's the address, ma'am? Like, we can't come find you unless you get the address. And she's like, I don't know the freaking address. Like, just hurry up. Like, I'm, I live here. Like, uh, come get me. I need help. So my fiance has taken over the mixing because that was just a lot. <laughs> so she hangs up the phone because she sees Claire and Oliver walking towards the front door and she starts bolting it to the living room. You're thinking, how is she gonna play it off? I mean, they're gonna, if they find out that their boss is dead, are they really gonna be on her side? Probably not. So she sits in the living room just pretending to read a magazine. And when they both see her, I don't, I don't want to say alive, but that's kind of the vibe that I got. When they both see her on the couch, they're kind of surprised. I mean, this was the same routine as last time. Anytime that Henry had killed Elizabeth, he had given the servants the day off, and then they would come home, and then they would be ready to bury a friend. Bury a beats, Billie Eilish. But she was alive, so they, they immediately are a little bit confused by this. And she's like, oh, well, Henry's upstairs taking a nap. He's not feeling well and they both seem so suspicious. So Oliver goes to his room and Claire goes into the kitchen to put down the groceries and this is when you see that Claire is having a massive heart attack. She drops everything to the ground and reaches for her phone, is able to call 911, give them the address and they come and put her on a stretcher and they take her away. So as the hospital is taking, a, like the paramedics are taking Claire away on the stretcher, Elizabeth is headed toward the front door. She's ready to escape and Oliver is right up behind her and says, if you leave, I can't protect you from the police. And she turns around and she's like, what do you mean, protect me? Why would, I, why would I need protection? I need protection from you guys, not the other way around. I don't need you to help me. And he's like, but I know he's dead. I know you killed him. Where's his body? So she's like, listen, I can explain. Like, I, he tried to kill me. You have to believe me. He tried to kill me. I didn't just kill him. And Oliver's like, I believe you. I do. Where's his body? So they go upstairs, they go into the elevator, and they find Henry's body. And Oliver actually helps her dispose of this body outside. And she's like, I don't understand any of this. Like, wh what's happening here? What is going on inside this house? Like, what's wrong with you guys? And that is when Oliver looks at her and says, you dreamt of a brilliant man who would steal you away and you know hide you away from all the ugly parts of the world then you would have, to have this own little world together and she's like how would you possibly know that like those are my thoughts after this wedding like i didn't even say that to anyone it's not like in my vows how could you possibly know that and he completely ignores her and is like well tell me about your childhood and she's like well i mean you don't remember much well, i mean i do like i was i was 8 years old and my parents died in a car crash and I was sick a lot. I was always in and out of hospitals. That's all I really remember. And you had a French like groundskeeper at the orphanage. You stayed at the orphanage till you were eight. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. And she's like, what am I? I don't understand. And he's like, you went into the forbidden room. Yeah, and I saw some things. Yeah, you saw yourself. Yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. What am I, Oliver? And he tells her, you were cooked in that room like an egg. There are six copies of you, six genetic copies of Elizabeth, and you are Elizabeth number five. So as she's hearing this, you know, they're outside disposing of the body and they hear a car and Oliver's like, describe the car to me. So she describes the car and he's like, that, that is Henry's only friend. That's Frank. He's a freaking detective and he's on Henry's payroll. We gotta, we gotta make sure that he's not suspicious of everything. So she goes inside and she welcomes Frank into the house and he's like, well, where's Henry? Like, I want to talk to my friend Henry. And she's like, oh, he's upstairs taking a nap. He's so sick. So she explains to him that the reason that they've never personally met is because she has chronic fatigue syndrome, which Henry has talked 
talked about all the time. He says that my young wife has chronic fatigue syndrome and that's why nobody can meet her. But in reality, it's because he's got like six wives and they're all clones and they're not really a person or whatever. I don't know. Don't cancel me. Am I going to get canceled for saying clones aren't people? Yes, I will in 20 years. I'm going to get... <laughs> So she's trying to explain, you know, Henry is upstairs sleeping, he's not feeling well, and he's, she's like, well, that's weird. So you're explaining to me that Henry, your husband, is upstairs because he's not feeling well. Claire, another member of this household, she just went to the hospital because she has a heart condition, and you have chronic fatigue syndrome, and Oliver is blind. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's just me, but like my detective radar is going off, and it seems like this is more like a hospital than a house. And she's like, no, and all of a sudden, blood just splatters everywhere. And Oliver is holding up a shotgun, screaming, did I get him? And he's so calm. He's like, did I get him or did I miss? And she's like what? screaming her face off. Like, what is going on? Like, she's blood all over her face now. And she's like, why would you, why would you do that? He's like, don't feel bad for him. He's on Henry's payroll. When the first Elizabeth got out, she was free. She got through the front door and she was running through the, um, like the mountains trying to get help, trying to escape. And he just drove her straight back here. And he's been on his payroll ever since. And he knows that Henry's not sick. So she's like, I don't understand, I don't understand. She's freaking out. And she asks him, is Henry your father? Are you Henry's kid? And he's like, well, not anymore. He's not my dad anymore. And he explains the whole thing. There's a reason that you don't remember anything after you were eight years old, because he put you in those tanks after you were eight. So he made genetic copies of you guys. There was six of you. And up until you guys were eight years old, you lived in this house, you ate, and you just grew up as normal kids. And then at eight years old, he put you in those tanks. And that was about that. Every single night, he would go in there. He would give you guys physical therapy. He would make sure that your bones weren't deteriorating. And he would play these like clips so that you would memorize and have these memories that you think are real, but they're not real. You never had those memories. Your parents never died in a car crash. You were never in an orphanage. You were never sick as a kid. Like these are all false memories. I mean, she starts freaking out. Could you blame her? And she's like, I just, like, take me back to my honeymoon days. Like, this is not what I want. This is incredibly alarming. Like, I don't want to be here. And she starts covering her ears. She's freaking out. And he's like, yeah, but we need to go dispose of this body. So they yet again bring another body to where they disposed of Henry's body. And as they're getting rid of Frank, the detective, he starts telling her, I think that you should leave. I think you need to go into the closet and pack a go bag, take any clothes that you need, and just get out of here. And she's like, well, what about you? Why don't you come? Well, I can't. I have some stuff to do. So she's like, okay, okay, where do I go? He's like, I don't know, but just take some money from the safe. Okay, I mean, how much? I mean, it seems like she has no concept of money, right? Mm -hmm. And so he just turns around and goes like this, like holds up his fingers like, like that much? Like a stack of money. So she's like, okay. So she runs into the closet. She starts packing up her clothes, packing up the cash, and she's ready to go. But Oliver asks her for one last favor. He says, can you please read me this journal? She's like, is that Henry's journal? No, it's Claire's journal. But can you please read it to me? I need to know what's said in here. And obviously I can't read it myself. So she's like, okay. So she opens it up and as she starts reading, he runs out of the closet and locks her in there. And she starts freaking out. Like, what's going on? Like, why is he locking me in this closet? He told me that I can leave. Like, what's going on? Why am I locked in here with this freaking journal? So then he just disappears. And she decides instead of crying, instead of like trying to escape, she's just gonna read the journal. <laughs> So we used hot cocoa powder, as in hot chocolate powder, because I don't know why. That's what it felt like it would be in the recipe. Didn't it feel like it? Didn't it just feel right? <laughs> Didn't it feel like, ooh, that makes sense? I thought that's what it is. But, but, here's the crazy thing. We need cocoa powder, like the baking one, which you would assume that I have in the house because like we bake sometimes, but I ran out. I don't have any. So uh, we're waiting for the cocoa powder to come, but I'm not going to be show you guys the whole process. I'm going to take it from where we left off of us actually mixing it, but I wanted to get to a certain point in the story before we wait for that. So here's what's going on, okay? Because this is where it all starts to make sense and it all starts to get juicy. Claire is not an employee of the house, actually. So this journal is from Claire's perspective and it all starts five years ago. She had an invitation to come see Dr. Henry. Um, what he was known for is he was able to alter 
her RNA cells. I don't know what this means, but he is like this god of genetics, like god of the genome, whatever you call it. And this was an absolute honor because he had pioneered it, he had patented it, and then he had just retired a billionaire and then fallen off the face of the earth. He no longer came to medical seminars, he no longer stayed in his profession. It didn't seem like he had this crazy love to try to like keep pioneering more things. So she gets a call from him and this came at a really good time because she had just recently gotten fired from her hospital for not divulging, like not cahooting with the military. Like the military wanted to know everything about all of her studies, about how to train a brain, how to like implant memories into a brain. And she was like, I am not sharing that with the military because I am using this type of information to actually help people. The military is not going to use it in order to help people. You know, that's kind of crazy. So she gets fired from her hospital and Dr. Henry reaches out to her. So she takes a taxi into these beautiful mountain woods to go see Dr. Henry. And this is where it starts getting crazy. He knows a lot about her and they sit down, they start talking and he says, well, I want to show you my lab. So they go into the basement room and he enters the lab and she sees all six of the Elizabeths in their tanks with tubes on. And she immediately runs out of the house. And the next scene, we just hear her having this conversation with Dr. Henry. Like this is, this is like ethically, morally, like this is, this, this is insane. Like this, I should call the police on you. Like I should call the medical board on you. Like they, what are you doing? And she writes in her journal that she, which she thought was her getting her biggest moment in her career to work with, you know, one of the best doctors of her generation. But instead, she had just entered into a tragic love story. So Elizabeth was actually Henry's wife when, um, when he was young, and she gave birth to Oliver. And during that birth process, one of her genes, like it, there was a mutation and it just, it killed her. There was something that went wrong and there was always a mutation in her gene and it got triggered by her giving birth. Me trying to Google that because now I'm scared. How do I know? I don't have that. I don't know. And she ended up dying away. And he was really, really upset. Now him being this crazy doctor, he thought maybe, maybe I can bring her back. Maybe she's not actually dead. So he got her stem cells and he created six genetic copies of Elizabeth, harvested them and created Elizabeth. So now he has six of them and he raised them until they were eight years old. And then there started to be health issues, like tons of health issues. So he started freaking out and he created these crazy incubator tubes, like incubator things. And he placed them in there to try to stall so that he could figure out what went wrong again. This wasn't supposed to happen. You know, this only her mutation got triggered with her giving birth. Like they're only eight years old. When Elizabeth was eight, she didn't have any problems. So from then on, he would just take them out one by one every single night to give them some physical therapy to play these tapes in their head of all of the real Elizabeth, his wife's memories, so that they could really assume her identity. Now, the first two died in the incubator tube. So there was only four Elizabeths by the time that Claire really started working on the project. So she was like, okay, you know what? Even if this isn't the most morally, ethically correct thing, think about it. Like you, you're a crazy doctor. You love all of these advances in medical history. You have the chance and you have the resources. This billionaire is giving you resources to really, without a board, certifying every little thing you do, watching over every little thing you do. There's no guidelines. There's no ethical guidelines you can try whatever you want. I mean, of course, any intelligent doctor is going to be really intrigued. Me? No, I'm out of there. You're creepy, dude. And so she's sitting there. She's trying to figure out what's wrong with their genes. And she thinks that she finally cracked the code. So they wake up Elizabeth number three. So the first two Elizabeth died, right? And then Elizabeth number three wakes up and, um, didn't go well. She was just uh, panicked. She didn't retain any of the information that they had played to her. She had like no memories. Her only two memories was that she says, yes, I remember being happy two times. One time I played in a field and one time I had a chocolate milkshake. And she was just acting bizarre. Like she was not acting like a human. She also couldn't retain any new information after about like 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds she'd be like, who are you? And they were just like, what went wrong here? And even though biologically and physically and physiologically, she seemed incredibly healthy because you have two doctors monitoring her, but she seemed to be in a lot of pain and they couldn't understand why. Like she would just start crying in physical pain, but there was no point of physical pain that they could you know, pinpoint. So she starts freaking out, but Henry was like, you know what, it's okay. If I give her the love and attention that she needs, she's gonna come back and she's gonna start remembering things. Like this is gonna be my wife. And so he kept trying and trying. And then eventually somehow on Henry's watch, she 
made it into the forbidden room, saw the other Elizabeths, ran out, managed to get out of the house, and started running down the street. And that is when the detective, Frank, pulled her over and drove her back to Henry's place. Now Claire decides, you know what, I'm in this too deep. So she comes out and she says, did you find my niece? Oh God, thank God, she's, she's had such a troubled history, I mean, I don't know what's wrong with her. She, I'm her only living relative left, and we've been trying to help her, but mentally she's just really, she's really, did she say something to you? And Frank is like, yeah, he, she told me some bizarre things on the drive up here. And so it seems like this is the first time they're meeting the detective, right? And Claire's like, oh, you can't trust anything, she says. Truly, she's been through a lot, but she is very, very messed up in the head, you know what I mean? And so he's like, well, I don't know, I mean, I guess, but I, I still have to fill out a report, you know? That's what I gotta do, I gotta fill out this report. And that is when Henry is like, you know what, Claire? Why don't you go upstairs? Let me figure this out. So we can kind of assume that this is when Henry put Frank on the payroll. So, you know, she's reading this journal. I mean, we have to remember, even though we see the whole flashback and we're like into it, all of a sudden, Elizabeth stops reading the journal so we can't get more information because Oliver comes to the door and he's outside and he says, Elizabeth, I'm sorry. I know what it must feel like to be trapped in that room, but I had to run errands and I didn't know how, how else to keep you and make sure that you didn't leave. So, I mean, can I open the door? If you promise, if you promise not to do anything crazy. And she doesn't respond and she walks to the very back of the room and she's getting ready like full-on footballer pose and he opens the door and she tackles him to the ground and she's like tell me the door code tell me the door code right now and she takes off his belt not 50 shades don't get it twisted you nasty hoe i'm kidding i thought so too i was like oh my gosh what's happening but uh, he grabs the belt to tie him to a pole right which it doesn't really seem like the smartest way but maybe those were the only resources she had so she ties him to the pole and he's like no i'm sorry elizabeth but like you have to understand like i can explain and and she rushes to the front door and guess what? It wasn't the right code. So now Elizabeth is really freaking pissed and she runs back upstairs looking for him. She grabbed a kitchen knife, you know, she's ready to go. She's ready, it's Oliver, you're done. Benito, you're dead. And she finds him in the forbidden room giving a massage to one of the Elizabeths. And he says, listen, I understand, but I need to keep doing this now that Henry is gone because I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy how much you start caring about people when they don't even know that you exist. So it kind of implies that Oliver had did this to Elizabeth, you know, before they even officially met and he seems to somewhat care about them maybe. And he's like, I can't, I can't run from you. You know that and I can't hide. You have the advantage, you know, implying that she is the one with the knife and the eyesight. And so he's like, you have the advantage. Can you at least help me flip her over so that I can finish the rest of this? And Elizabeth is just so intrigued by seeing another Elizabeth, which, like I said, can you blame her, that she puts down the knife and she goes to flip her over and Oliver injects her to make her pass out. I don't know where he got this smart kiddo. And then she wakes up chained into her bed, like chained into the room where her bed is, like her bedroom. So continuing on in the journal, Elizabeth number three dies. Claire is stressed out because she's like, I don't know where I went wrong. Like I, this was supposed to be perfect. This was supposed to work. I am a brilliant scientist. I'm a crazy, you know, medicine person. And she starts freaking out. Meanwhile, she initiates an affair with Henry. So they start sleeping together on the side. But she knew that this was just an affair between two colleagues letting off steam because she could never compete with Elizabeth and she knew this so one time they were laying in bed just talking about you know what's your goal in life like you're this crazy retired billionaire you're incredibly smart do you ever think about what you want to do with the rest of your life I mean is this what you want to do with the rest of your life and Henry tells her that he just wants to relive his wedding night one more time and she thought she found this a little bit creepy you know being a normal woman she was like um that's creepy why like you <laughs> Imagine after like being married to someone and they're like, I just wish I could relive my wedding night of all nights. Not the wedding, the wedding night. You know what this is implying. So she's like, I mean, I guess that makes sense. What a dude thing to say. And he's saying, no, you just don't understand. It was euphoric. Elizabeth is like a force of, a force of, yeah, a force of joy. You've told me hundreds of times, we get it. And this is when he's like, whoa, like, is this girl jealous? Like, she, he starts freaking out. Henry's like, wow, this is my colleague. We were just blowing off some steam. Now he, she seems jealous of my, like, wife, ex-wife. I don't even know. My late wife. And he's like, well, maybe you should go. So she rushes into her room, starts packing up all of her bags. And as she's about to leave, she wrote, 
Choices are the things that define people, but for whatever reason, she couldn't leave. And so the next morning, she showed back in the laboratory and started working on Elizabeth again. And that is when she realizes something. And she confronts Henry. And Claire said, I tried to look, and I couldn't find any evidence of Elizabeth giving birth anywhere. And he's like, well, I thought maybe, maybe she, if she woke up, she wouldn't want this decaying old body. Maybe she would want someone that she fell in love with. Oliver is not your son. Oliver is you. Oh. So he made a cologne of himself? Yeah, and Oliver has no idea. Oliver thinks he's the son. Oh. And so she realizes that Oliver is not Oliver, but Oliver is Henry. And she starts freaking out because, I mean, can you imagine? She freaking hates Henry and to know that this is another Henry, but she's hoping to kind of change it. So Oliver comes up to her and puts a knife to her throat and demands for her to tell him everything about in this journal. You know, the, what, what did she say about me? Who am I? It seems like Oliver has some suspicions about who he is. He doesn't necessarily think that he is the son, right? And um, he starts asking her and she tells him, no, 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 you, you are the son of Elizabeth and Henry. He's your dad. But that doesn't mean that you have to be like him. That You can be whoever you want to be. I mean, he, he showed Claire the birth certificate. He showed her the hospital records. You, you're Henry's son. You're not Henry. And he starts freaking out and he starts pacing the room with this knife because he's just confused. He doesn't know how to feel. And she starts seducing him because I think maybe in her head, she's like, if this is Henry, Henry is a perv. Henry's going to fall for it. Not saying like this is him, but you know, I guess maybe she has a lot of faith in genetics making the same person, right? Mm -hmm. So she starts kind of seducing him, he comes over to her and she chains him down onto the ground, grabs the key to the lock on her on her ankle and gets the new door code. So this time she's about to be a free woman. And as she's about to leave, suddenly the last Elizabeth shows up with a shotgun and is pointing it at them both. Now mind you, this Elizabeth has no idea what this Elizabeth has just read in the journals, has no idea what, what any of this is going on. Yeah. And Elizabeth Elizabeth is trying to tell her, I'm Elizabeth too. Like we're both Elizabeth. I am me and you are me and we are the same people. And she is like, Henry, tell me what's going on. So she is calling Oliver Henry at this point, which is very confusing, okay? So she's like, Henry, tell me what's going on. And he tells her that this girl is psycho. I chained her up to this bed because I need to keep her safe. Then we find out that this Oliver character has convinced the last Elizabeth that the reason that they're stuck in this isolated house is because outside air is dangerous. It's an apocalypse. You know, everyone's going to die. And she keeps trying to go outside and I'm just trying to protect her. And so she's got the gun up pointing at her. And Elizabeth, you know, is like, you know what? I have survived way too much for this. She grabs the scissors and stabs him in the foot, Oliver, grabs him and puts him in front of her to shield her from the last Elizabeth, right? Uh -huh. And eventually she's like explaining to her, like we were made in a lab, this is what's going on, you have to believe me, I can explain everything. And she shoots. And Oliver slumps to the floor dead. And she runs out of the room. And she runs and she runs and then she makes it to the stairs right in front of the front door and then she looks down and collapses because she's bleeding everywhere. Because she had been shot too. Like went through all of her, I guess. Uh. So she's like, okay, it's fine. She has this vision of an Elizabeth hanging out in the fields, like going outside, hanging out in a garden. Remember the other Elizabeth was like, I just remember chocolate milkshakes and hanging out in a field. And uh -huh. so she's like, I just need to make it to the front door. Goes to the door, puts in the code, and right as she's outside, the last Elizabeth shoots her again. And then she comes up to her and studies her face because she's confused, you know, and is studying her face and Elizabeth whispers to her to get the journal. So we have the last Elizabeth, the lone survivor. She cleans up the house, gets rid of the bodies and finishes the journal. So Claire's last entry in this journal was how in the middle of the night she had heard a noise and it was coming from, you know, the living room area. So she thought maybe something had happened to the next Elizabeth. This was Elizabeth number four. Mm -hmm. So the one that, you know, he had killed, the very first one in the movie. So there's blood everywhere. I mean, that was, he had killed her with this giant knife, right? Mm -hmm. And she is shocked by this because initially she thought that the third Elizabeth had died by suffocation and that something was wrong with her, her medical stuff. And she starts freaking out and she's like, how could you, how could you do this? This is, wh why would you do this? This doesn't make any sense. And he tells her that after this, he's going to transfer everything into her own name. 
he, she is gonna have all of his assets when he dies. Who? Claire, as long as, you know, she keeps quiet about this. And she's like, no, I'm gonna call the police. Call the police and tell them what? That I just murdered a woman who died decades ago? Is that what you're gonna tell them? That doesn't make sense. They're gonna ask you if you've been drinking tonight. They're gonna ask you, maybe you snuck some drugs from a pharmacy. They're not gonna believe you, Claire. And she's just confused. Like, I don't understand. Why, why would you even do this? This is, this is our life's work right now. Like, the, we are trying so hard to make these people alive and you're killing them? Like, why would you do that? And he explains, well, that's not how it started. You don't, I didn't spend so much of my life trying to revive my wife just to kill her. But it just happened. And somewhere, even they knew that it wouldn't work. They look like my wife, Elizabeth. They act like her. They're supposed to be her, but they're not my Elizabeth. And even something in their own eyes lets me know that they know that it's not gonna work. And it's only through the act of destroying them that they finally feel real to me. So oh. he's explaining that these clones don't feel human. They don't feel real to him until he's killing them because maybe it's like such a human thing to want to like fight for your life, to not want to die. Mm -hmm. Or to know that, hey, this is real because I can kill you, so that means you're real. And so Claire, instead of doing anything, she decides to wait it out. She okay. thinks that she's gonna wait for all these Elizabeth to die, and then Henry's gonna die, and she's gonna get all of his money, and she can finally do some good in the world with all this money. So pretty much the day is over and like the sun is down. If you guys are watching the audio version, I'm sorry because the rest of me is gonna be cooking. I will, however, sum up the video for you, or sum up the movie for you. So at this point, you know, the last Elizabeth that has ever existed, the sixth of the six Elizabeth Harvest clones, she just murdered Elizabeth number five, who we've been following through most of this entire movie, right? And so she reads the rest of the journal, finds out that she's the last one, goes through all of this process and she packs a bag and on her way out she runs into Claire. Now you would think, you would think, I mean I thought, I thought she would go into a homicidal rage and murder the shit out of Claire, but she doesn't. She tells her that she deserves this house. Claire? Yeah. I don't know why, maybe it's because Claire like tried to help them, mm -hmm. tried to succeed and so she leaves and as she's walking away from the mansion in her head it says, I had a dream that I met a brilliant man. And she goes through that whole thought process too. And then the last words were, but now I am free. Boom. That's it. <laughs> Wait, why did Hera create six of them? Because that's all he could create. And he was worried because, you know, when you are doing something like that, he wanted, he wanted the chance to make sure it's done right. So he had six chances to bring his wife back, essentially, in his mind. But it never worked well. Yes. Yeah, so the first two, it seems like they genuinely died. Uh -huh. And then maybe he started murdering. Maybe he started murdering all of them, right? But he murdered number three and number four. Uh -huh. And he tried to murder number five. So it seems that somewhere along the way, he was getting frustrated because even if they were retaining their information, even if they were healthy, he, he didn't feel like they were his wife. They didn't feel real to him. And so maybe out of anger and frustration, maybe he killed the first one, like maybe the third one, the very first murder. And he realized that the only time that his wife, Elizabeth, felt real to him was when he was murdering her. What kind of plot is that? <laughs> yeah. Like, how did he went from, um, and you're, you're going to completely blend it. How did he go from... How does he grow from trying to save, bring back the wife to, oh, I'm a serial killer? That is true. Right? Like yes. Like, he went from, like, I really love this woman. Yes. To, oh, I get a thrill from killing people. But maybe he needed this woman to feel so real. Like, the whole time it just felt like, you know, like, we talk about those stories of what if your fiancé comes back and they're a clone and something just feels off about them. Yeah. And you just don't have the same feeling anymore. Maybe he was feeling like, this isn't my wife. And the only time he felt like Elizabeth was real was when he was murdering her. And what's the point of cloning himself? That I don't know. <laughs> like, what is the There were quite of... a bit of plot holes in this one. And why is he blind? So, okay, side note. <laughs> I took this out. He saw um, Henry 
touching the girls when they were eight. The son? Yeah, the son saw the dad. Well, not the dad, but you know, yeah. um, Henry, the original, you know, so assaulting the girls. Blind. Yeah. And then um, the dad blinded him and told everyone it was an electrical fire. And he said from that point on that he wasn't his dad anymore. But it wasn't oh. that important to the story, you know, because we, you know, I mean, he's already a murderer, serial killer, cloner, mad scientist. Now he's a pedo. Sounds like there's a lot of plot holes. Yeah. And clear, we went to the hospital. Just yeah, like for that? a genuine heart condition. <laughs> what? So this. While, uh, while the most important part of the movie was going on, she was just like, "I'm just gonna dip to the hospital real quick <laughs> yes. and come back to inherit everything." Yes, pretty what? much. What? And Oliver's dead now. I don't know how I feel about I feel like it. He has so much talent. Who? The doctor? No, Henry. Yeah, the doctor. The doctor. Yeah. But he chose to do some dumb shit. But you know what I think the ending of this movie means? What? I think it's very reminiscent of um, of just serial killers, you know? Maybe they don't think that women are real until they murder them. Just sick and twisted. I just don't understand. Okay, so... <laughs> I should have listened to the ratings. <laughs> I, I was debating between watching this one or The Handmaiden, which is a Korean movie. It's an erotic psychological thriller. Really should have gone with that one instead. And there's naked people. Oh, there was a lot of naked nakedness in this one. This one was good, but I think it's good as long as, you know, you don't do what you just did, which is start questioning the plot, because then it all just falls apart. But what would you do? What would you do if you were a billionaire, you had access to all this money, and the one person that you want to live with <laughs> is gone? <laughs> The one person, me, is gone. And you have my stem cells conveniently because I, I don't know, I guess I just storage them on like an SD card. <laughs> I'm uh, kidding, I'm not an idiot, guys. You know, and then you can genetically clone me. Would you do it? Would you genetically clone me? Why would I do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Why would I do that to myself? <laughs> what do you mean? You don't want six of me running around the house? Can you imagine what a party that would be? That'd be gnarly. Bro, I want six of me running around the house. Finally, I'll have someone who talks to me. <laughs> Why did the last one come back at the end? Why didn't they come back in the middle? What was she doing the whole time? She was getting brainwashed by Henry. Or Oliver, remember? Uh, it's like I'm expecting something much Smarter? more complex. complex. Yeah, uh-huh. Like, Henry is too smart to be this dumb. No, but like you, you, you think, you think it's gonna be much more complex, but it's just two horny dudes with some money. You know, that's the plot, that's the plot of this. I think there's a couple morals of this story, right? Yeah. I think the first is, you know, I think even a treadmill in your house is kind of like an evil thing to do. A full on laboratory, you know, that's, that's just evil. Don't have a laboratory in your house, rule number one. Rule number two. What was I saying? <laughs> oh yeah, rule number two. Eat the rich, you know, if you didn't have the money. <laughs> if he paid taxes <laughs> on his billions of dollars, this definitely wouldn't have happened, you know? I'm just thinking, talking down my asshole right now. I don't know anything about politics, but I'm trying to sound like I do. So now once you've added the condensed milk, which yes, I know this is a two ingredient recipe that I've turned into a whole day thing. Normally it shouldn't go like this as long as you don't get hot chocolate powder. Now we're gonna knead the bread and then I'll show you what it's supposed to look like and then you have to put it into the fridge for another hour. So I'll be right back after I get you the end result. Starts like this, you just literally knead it like a dough of bread. Now you gonna make it like this and then, and then you just grab this and you saran wrap it. You wanna make it into the shape of the truffle, like you're gonna cut it. So you're gonna want it cubed, I think is the cutest, like the video. So now you've got a flattened out, it looks like a really flat chocolate brownie. Stick it into the fridge for an hour and we're almost done. The next day. I forgot to end the video. This is gonna be the ASMR version of how to make the two ingredient truffles. This has been probably over 24 hours. Thank you, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have a job in this or? No. Just spread it. You're fine. No. It won't spread. Oh. That's okay. Pretend that didn't happen. Wait, are you really pretending like that didn't happen? Yeah, it's okay. But we saw that. I it's saw okay. that. It's okay. Oh, that's awkward. I'm
messed up. Truffles are complete. The two ingredient truffles only took about 48 hours. <laughs> I'm really proud of us. Really, really proud. But I'm gonna try it. Maybe it tastes, maybe it tastes like it's worth 48 hours, no? <laughs> what is mm. that face? Mm. You don't sound so impressed. Mm. It's bitter. Mm. It's just like um what I imagine fancy people eating chocolate. It's not milk chocolate, it's more like that 75% pure cacao chocolate. It's not like that Hershey's chocolate, you know what I mean? It's really bougie for us. I feel like Henry and Elizabeth would have really enjoyed this <laughs> in their mansion. Who's that? <laughs> People in the pit. Um, ah. <laughs> oh, oh! Ow! All right, this, this video, I just have to make an apology. A formal apology. I'm sorry, this one was a show and i'll see you guys tomorrow <laughs>